and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Anna Davis Court, and today we're going to be illustrating in fresco. It is so wonderful to see you guys in the chat. I'm so happy to be back, everybody. It's been a while. Uh, we've got Wade and Alessandra saying hello and hola. Well, actually, Wade says hi. I have to quote him accurately. This is Club Wade, after all. <laughs> we've got Patrick. We've got Anthony Sims. Who are you? Hi. I've also got Corinne Hand. These are two of my best friends in the world. It's so nice to see everybody. Oliver, oh, thank you so much for being here. And good morning. Uh, it's 9 a.m. on the West Coast, and we only have an hour today. So I really want to jump into it because I have a lot to show you in fresco. The idea of the stream today is that we're going to be drawing these pastel creatures. However, I've been drawing with these awesome pastels in person. Is it green screening out the green? I wonder. Ooh. <laughs> anyways, yeah, I'm not in a posh New York loft like Paco would have you believe. But <laughs> uh, anyways, I have been working with these pastels and I want to show you um, on the iPad. I have this picture of some of the tools that I've been using lately. So on the left here, we've got all of the tools that I have. And on the right are the specific pastels that I want to be recreating the texture of today. They are called Karen Dosh, is that how you pronounce it? Who knows? I've never heard it. <laughs> and they are Neocolor aqua Aquarelles. Wow, a lot of words in my mouth. Can't say them. But they are so much fun, you guys. Have you ever just gone to an art store and treated yourself? Because that's what I did with these. <laughs> and they are wax pastels that are also water soluble. Now, they are wonderful and delightful and really fun to play with. However, there are limitations to traditional media. When I talk about traditional media, I just mean stuff you're using with your hands, not digital. So digital media is all the juicy stuff that we can do in Fresco and Photoshop and all the lovely digital products. So what I want to do is work with what we have, which is amazing. If you guys don't know, Fresco has some of my favorite brushes in the world. It is so great. It has live brushes, pixel brushes, vector brushes. Kyle Webster has outdone himself <laughs> with this programming and it really shows. So what I'm going to do is take one of his brushes that is absolutely beautiful and just tweak it a little bit and show you some of the settings that you can use to make the brushes really just sing for what you want to get out of them. I also know that a lot of people really want to add texture to their pieces. To their pieces. This is something that I hear about my work a lot of times is, how did you get that texture? Oh my gosh, it's such a ju juicy texture. And when we say juicy texture, it just means it really looks like you're holding it in your hand, even though you're seeing it on a screen. There is something to holding traditional media in your hands that I feel like is a magical experience and I highly recommend going to like fine art galleries and buying original pieces just to have that experience yourself. However, a lot of us are using digital media. So sorry, I hit you. That was my microphone. <laughs> but uh, the idea here is to get that feel digitally. You get it. Kendall says, I have those. They're fun to draw with. Mine broke the other day. Oh, no. Uh, it was both awesome and sad because now I can draw giant shapes, but sad because broken. Hey, I really like that silver lining. And also everybody in the chat today, feel free to shout out any questions or suggestions that you have because that is the joy of being live. Eustress in the chat, hello you, saying I just did this two weeks ago and bought some of them too. You guys are amazing. We are all on the same wavelength. Clever Devlin says hi, Anna, Sean, and everyone. Whoop, whoop, whoop. So yes, let's jump into what we have. You get the idea. These are the traditional media that we're recreating. And I wanted to show you just a first little step uh, that I did to create a canvas that already started feeling traditional. This is a piece of cardboard. <laughs> it was actually a backing sheet for stamps that I got in the mail. And what I did is I just threw a uh, brightness and contrast layer and just brightened it up a bunch and then set it to multiply. And it's over this like cream color. So there's that cream. And then there's the texture. First step, we're getting texture. And I tell you, <laughs> I used to think you could like make everything with brushes, but I do feel now that a lot of things are elevated with pictures. So if you have some kind of really cool paper or even just a piece of cardboard, this was a random picture. I took a picture of it. You could scan it, whatever. It adds so much texture to the piece. So you're starting with a palette that really feels right. So uh, I'm going to go through the steps that I did traditionally 
And then we're going to duplicate them digitally. So you can see here, this is a picture of a little piece of Bristol paper, which is what I've liked using lately. And this is just brush strokes of a color. The goal here is to create another level, level or layer of texture that is very freewheeling and like almost abstract in the way that you're laying it down. So what I want to do is jump into some of my favorite brushes here. Luckily, when you star things, it goes into a little folder that's called favorites. And we have so many options here. Now, these are just the pixel brushes, but I'm definitely going to use the watercolor live brushes as well. So what I'm going to uh, start with, I think, what should I start with? I think uh, the blocky mixer is a really good one to start with. I'm going to say a lot of uh, brush names, but that's kind of the beauty of having a live stream is you, if you ever want to go back and see what I picked out, then you can just go back into the video. All right, so now we're laying down a base. It's kind of see-through. There's little bits that are showing through. I love that. Uh, we've got a rake grit, and we can do a little bit of color change. Now, this is one of the cool tools that I found when I was looking at how to manipulate brushes just a little bit. If you go into, there's this bottom area on a brush. When you have a brush selected, it's got those little sliders. So you can see you're adjusting here. Uh, if you go down to the bottom, there's a thing called color dynamics, which has a little check mark next to it. You can uncheck it, you can check it, and then it applies. And then this one, I put a little bit of hue jitter on. So this means that you can have multiple strokes of the same brush have slightly different colors come out of them. You can see here, you can change the saturation, the brightness, and I don't know exactly what purity means, but I'm sure Kendall does because she's a brush maven. Uh, I I have to say, I am the first one to uh, say that I have <laughs> not no idea. I don't know everything about brush settings, but this is what I can tell you because I've tried it out and I've learned. So this is the kind of thing that I really hope you do is just play around and experiment to find what things do. All right, so you can see this is like super messy, super free flowing. It's really fun. Um, let's try another one. What was the one I really liked yesterday? I played around with a bunch of brushes, so it was um, it was a really fun experience. I think with this, one of the tips I would have is trying to stay in the same size family for a lot of it uh, so that you don't get really small marks and really big marks. They're all kind of similar. Whoa, that one's too dark. All right, a little bit lighter. And I'm just going for similar-ish colors and swiping around. Shoop, shoop, shoop. And I love little happy accident marks as well. Now it's time for the live brushes. I want to go in with the, this is called live brushes, but I'm going to go for watercolor wash flat. So this one's my favorite of the watercolors personally, but there's always a use for every one of them. And what I'm going to do is make sure that the color is somewhat significant. I'm going to go in probably with a slightly lighter and more saturated uh, green. I'm just going to start swashing it on there. I might want it even a little bit bigger. Swash, swash. You have to make noises when you do things like this. And I want to take it slow because sometimes the live brushes, they are very intense for the computer and so I want to just make sure that every stroke is intentional and then give it time to bleed out because look at that beautiful bleed when that happens oh my goodness I love it so one of the things that I discovered yesterday when playing with this is when you set the water flow really high and then the flow really low you can do a little bit of what I call like wetting of the surface. If you do multiple strokes in the same area, you can even kind of pull it out. You can create a really nice soft bleed on the edge there. Do you see how it's coming out and kind of creating that lighter green effect? Now I'm going to do it right here to see if we can get some really cool textures, especially on the edge, because most of this is going to be covered. Uh, by the pastel work that we're doing on top. But it's really good to have a strong foundation for this because as you see through the pastels, you're going to see through to this layer. And it just gives it so much more juicy texture. I keep saying juicy texture. What do you guys say? <laughs> Textury texture? Crackly? I don't know. <laughs> 
Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm so glad you guys are talking in the chat. Uh, Yusra says, how are you guys? I miss the streams too much or so much. Oh my gosh, I do too. If you don't know, I moved recently and I haven't streamed for quite a while. So it's it's been hard missing you guys. It's like a whole community here that we have. And I absolutely love seeing you guys. So the feeling is mutual. I'm so glad to be back. And I hope that you have been doing just absolutely swimmingly in your life. All right, so we've got this textured surface to start on. Now we can always come back to this because that's the beauty of digital. You can always come back. You always have that layer accessible. And I'm gonna say this a million times, but there are pros and cons to digital, pros and cons to traditional media. <laughs> Wade says crunchy, chunky, depending on the texture. I like that chunky texture, yes. <laughs> Anthony says, yes, I am the Anthony Sims. Uh, good to see you again, Wade. Oh, everybody's reuniting and it feels so good. <laughs> Jack says, I do like chonky texture. Jack, you would. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's dive into the next layer. In our traditional journey, let's see what the next thing is. So I, I took a picture of every step in the process for you guys. So I hope you appreciate this. So next I draw out a kitty cat, a little gato. All right, so what I'm going to do is hop out here and I'm going to use, I have to say my hands down favorite brush in Fresco. I know it's not fair to pick favorites, but like I use it for everything and it's just the pencil brush. I don't know why it's so good, but it is. It's just too good. I'm going to use a red one because that's what I usually use in real life and very loosely, like I'm not even zooming in here. I'm very like just throwing it in a little cat. And this is exactly how I've been drawing it traditionally, too, is just like really loose. And if I do it wrong and I'm like, oh, that head's too big or that neck's too thick, I just like I draw on top of it. It's not something where it has to be perfect. You're going to be using pastels on top of this. So it really does not matter. And the beauty of digital here, I cannot do this traditionally, is I can move it. Oh, my gosh, it feels so good. You guys, you don't even know. I've been spending so long drawing and redrawing trying to get the right composition for these guys and on here i can just move it <laughs> move it all right i'm gonna give a little bit of a tilt to the head that you can see with like the the nose and the eyes this is definitely not perfect placement whatsoever but it's just to start to give an idea all right so now we've got our little cat outline now what's the next step and these steps are going to go quick, so just watch and follow along. So next, I bust out the pastels. So this is the time where I want to slow down and look at the brush side of things because I made this, well, I, I took what Kyle has and I made it into something a little bit different, ever so slightly tweaked. All right, so uh, we're going to use blue, so I'll be working with that. And right now I want to open up this little list I have of what we're going to do. So I'm going to start with a brush called Hard Pastel, and I'm going to go into the settings on that bottom of the menu on the left side. And what I am doing is just resetting it just to make sure that none of the things that I changed are still uh, applying to this so that I'm starting from zero just like you guys. So brush reset. Boom. So what we're starting with, let's go to that kind of blue color. I think I'm going to do probably around 50 for the size and sorry, I hit you again. Uh, I'm going to just put in a little bit of a swash here of what the brush looks like just regularly. I think that here, let me, I see a little color dynamics on there. So I'm just going to, a zoop, 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 zoop. And then zoop. All right. So that's what our brush looks like right now. Then what we're going to do is turn the spacing up to 25%. And that's just around. It does not have to be exact. So here we go. That's what that looks like. Zoop, zoop, zoop. Here, I got to turn off the green so you guys can see it. Beep. All right. And then I'm going to go to the next one. I have shape dynamics. So if you go into this menu, you've got shape dynamics is the first like inner menu. So when you go into that, you're gonna see a lot of different options and I don't want you to be uh, intimidated by this. It's just go one at a time and understand them. So the size jitter, if you go up and down, you can see exactly what it's doing, which is jitter usually means that it's like randomizing in some way, at least that's my understanding. Then there's control. The biggest thing I think that 
changes this brush for me is I'm taking the control from pen pressure to none, which when it's controlled by pen pressure, it means that when you're pressing really lightly, it's small. And when you're pressing hard, it gets big. What I want is a consistent size of line because I think that's truer to what pastels are like. Uh, if I'm pressing harder, I'm not going to get a huge ton bigger. Uh, and it just, especially for digital tools, I feel like that works better. And then I'm going to change the minimum diameter to 25. That means that uh, we are making sure that the smallest it can be is uh, only this far away from the biggest it can be. So it's just a little bit of a control there. All right, next. Oh, yes, we should color it in because we earned it. So not a huge difference right now. It's not crazy different yet, but we will get there. The first few are like small little differences, but trust me, over an entire piece, it really does make a difference to have the, it dialed into exactly what you want. All right, so next one underneath shape dynamics is scattering. So again, we're gonna go to the control and we're gonna set that to pen pressure, we got that. And then the count jitter goes up to 65. All right, check that out. You can see up above how it changes and how it looks. This one, uh, is just the count of different things. Like, I, I don't understand how to, all of it works, but <laughs> I'm pretending like, oh yes, it's the count. But there is something to sw like sweeping through from little to big and seeing what kind of changes each of the sliders has and feeling it out for yourself and understanding exactly like what it is, is less important than what it's doing for your brush. So next step. We're going to go down to transfer, boom, right underneath scattering and control is going to be set to pen pressure. So this means that um, transfer is basically like the opacity control for the brush. So when you are uh, pressing lightly with the pen, it's going to be less opaque. And then as you press harder, it's going to be more opaque. So pen pressure and then opacity jitter, I set to 25. Whoop. And here you're gonna start to see a bit of a difference. It's softer, it's a little bit more um, crayon-like in my mind, and that is what I want. This is exactly what I'm looking for. Now the hard pastel already worked really well, so you can totally use it out of the box. I'm just making these changes for me. Okay, last but not least is color dynamics, which we lightly touched on before. So I'm going to uh, check the box, I'm gonna go in, and instead of uh, apply per tip, do you see that at the bottom? I'm gonna uncheck that because the difference between that is um, when you, here, I'll just show you. It's better to show than tell. So what I'm gonna do actually is turn it really high up so you can see. So I'm gonna do hue jitter a lot. You can see at the top, there are tons of colors in this now. So apply per tip means that it's going to be every stamp of the brush gets a different hue uh, or that like jitter is applied to it. But when you uncheck that, then, oh, it's all one color. Why is that? Well, you do it again and again and again, and each sweep is a slightly different color. That's closer to what I want. So again, this is just what I feel is right for me. Uh, but that is definitely not like a rule. It's just for you guys to understand. And so I'm going to do, uh, let's see. So I did no hue jitter and then brightness 3%, just tiny little, like this one's the only one that you really have to be delicate about because there is a huge difference when you're like uh, sliding that around. It can be wildly different colors or only slightly different colors, just depending on how it's going. All right. So let's swatch that in there. Boop. Now that was all one line. So I'm going to add a few more just to show you the, the brightness change. There you go. All right, so there is our final brush after all of the, these little tweaks. Again, it is really up to you what you want this to be. Uh, and so I'm not saying at all that you have to do one thing or another. I want you to follow your heart with this and make the brush what you want it to be. Hopefully this helps a little bit in understanding uh, what kind of settings do what 
and how to change it but there is a world of brush knowledge out there and if you want to check it out there actually is a brush hour of specifically pastel brushes that Kyle did last year if you just google like Kyle Webster pastel brushes Adobe Fresco Adobe Live all those kind of things you will find it and it is a really good watch so if you want to understand pastel brushes specifically I highly recommend let's turn on our background layer again and now when we, oh wait, whoops, I had that on the wrong layer. <laughs> Gotta make noises once again. Okay, so when we were following our traditional journey, we started filling in the cat with this blue pastel. One thing I want to pay attention to when doing this digitally is to try to, that's too, mm, let, the values are off here. So let's look at our traditional one. The green is much lighter and the blue is much darker. So what I'm going to do is, fix that. So this is one of the things in traditional media that is a little bit like a good limitation <laughs> sometimes is that you're locked into colors and techniques and traditional media that puts down its mark and you can't always change its color. So it really depends on how you're thinking about it, whether it's a pro or a con for either. It's just uh, in my mind, you are more tied down in the traditional world and sometimes limitations are good. So what you want to do is make sure that you're not uh, losing your values, losing your colors when you go to digital just because you aren't limited. Okay, so this is lighter, a little bit more uh, pigmented. i merge that down. And then the blue that we're using, I'm going to just darken it a touch and see how that comes out. See, that's a little too dark. And I could totally color uh, pick from my traditional piece, but I'm assuming that you guys would not have a traditional piece that you're picking from. So that's the idea. Oh, Kendall has a question. Says, is there a way to save a modded brush in Fresco or does uh, or still only in Photoshop? So I'm not sure exactly about like exporting a brush file in Fresco. I don't know about that. However, I know that when you change the settings for a brush, it keeps it unless you reset it. And this is across all your pieces. So if you go out of this piece into another one that you're working in in Fresco, you will have the same brush settings that you modded in here. So at least across Fresco, it's all saved, which is awesome. All right, so I'm gonna start just coloring in what I exactly how I do it traditionally. Uh, I try to think about not erasing, basically. This is the idea. So every mark should be intentional and every mark is going to stay that way. So I'm going to try really hard not to erase unless I have to, especially at the beginning, because this is something that I want to feel as traditional as possible. And I feel like that is kind of the mark of a traditional piece is feeling like it is one and done. <laughs> uh, now, I will talk about this as we go on, but the idea of working digitally opens that up, right? You can always fix it. You can always change it. And it's a blessing and a curse. So I wonder, how do you guys feel about that? Do you want the freedom to always be able to erase? Or do you feel like it is sometimes overwhelming to have that ability whenever you want? And also, how do you know a piece is done when you can always fix it, change it, do whatever you want to it? I am very curious because I feel like that is a, an eternal struggle of the creative person <laughs> is knowing when things are done and feeling out uh, if that's right, wrong, left, whatever. <laughs> so as I come up to the face, that's a particularly careful part that I want to pay attention to. Oh, oh, I don't want to zoom in too much, though. So what I want to do is avoid the eyes and nose. See, in traditional media, the wax pastels create a resist on the paper, meaning that you can't draw over it very well. Um, so if I'm using colored pencils, like the base layer, I would want to uh, mark out where I avoid, basically. So what I'm going to avoid is the eyes and the nose. You can have options of like drawing with a uh, colored pencil and then going around it. For some reason, I like going around it and then drawing with colored pencil. That's just my preference, but you do you. Uh, Kendall says, okay, I knew about the part, but what uh, that part, but wasn't sure if I could export it yet. Oh, you gotta do some research. Sorry, Kendall, I don't know that one off the top of my head. 
<laughs> Annika says, is it done yet? <laughs> Hi, Annika. How are you? <laughs> uh, Kendall says, I like both. Sometimes being stuck with a mistake is better to learn from than being able to always fix it. I agree. I feel like there is something about that where it's like, maybe it's not even a mistake. Who knows? Uh, Clever Devlin says, I love to, uh, I love the erase and especially the option button to erase with the brush. Okay. That is my favorite feature in Fresco is the little eraser button down here. Oh my gosh. It erases with the brush you're drawing with. It's too good. But anyways, uh, I, I agree with all of the things, all the things you guys say. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is add little stripes on the face, but stripes in negative space. So what I'm doing is avoiding certain areas and then I can kind of tip them off shoop, shoop. and then I'm going to make the nose right there. And remember the, um, the colored pencil lines that I had before are more, uh, what do you, they ca call it in Pirates of the Caribbean? They're guidelines really. So <laughs> I can break my rules anytime I want to, like I just did on do, ah, do as I say, not as I do. Okay, so on the forehead, it's one of the most complicated features that I love adding to these cats. And it's a little, um, what would you call it, like a double cross on their forehead to imply like stripes, basically. So to avoid the area that I want to have the negative space of, I am going to do a little like shortcut that I found, basically. So I do a line across the head, but with a little gap in the middle. And then I just do another one. And I'm trying to have the gap in the middle line up with the center of the face. And then a third one. And then I'm done. Okay. So then I just get to fill in the gaps on the edge so that it looks like this. And then I can cap off the end. And boom, there we go. We've got our little double cross. And then the ears are very simple. Boop -a doop. The reason I wanted to show you guys this cat is I've done it like you were saying the the mistake side of things mistake in quotations makes you do it again and again if you want to get it quote unquote right <laughs> a lot of quotes flying around so the idea here is that it's iterative that you can do it again if you feel like there was a mistake or that you could do better or whatever you want so i've made a lot of these cats not necessarily because they're like oh my gosh the best design in my magnum opus or whatever it's because they are a simple design that i can really get used to the media with and for some reason i just love drawing them so i would highly recommend if you find something that you really love like this or that just kind of jives with your brain try it out multiple times don't shy away just because you're doing the same thing again and again I think there's too much of that kind of judgment that you have to like do a different thing every single time that you're drawing or painting or making whatever. And it's not necessary. So just follow your bliss. <laughs> hey, is bliss in the chat today? <laughs> follow bliss. <laughs> oh, Anthony Jackson's in the chat. Hey, it says, I feel like this piece will tell you, uh, tell you to stop adding marks on it. <laughs> That's how you know the piece is done. So the piece is talking to you. I totally understand. Yes. When it's just like, it feels, feels like it's saying no. <laughs> okay. So now we've got our blue down. Next step in the process, I drew out a little bit of uh, outlines of things that I wanted to avoid. So I made little sparkles and little whiskers. And then around that, I filled it in with the dark green. So let's go in with dark green. And again, this is all based on the color palette that I have in real life. I was at the art store about mm, 10 minutes before it closed. <laughs> I'm gonna go a little darker. And uh, one of the things that I was just hemming and hawing over, there were 5 million things I wanted to buy. But one of the things was uh, these Aquarelle uh, pastels. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, so they have a sale. I'm going to do a few little whiskers. Zoop, zoop, zoop. And as I'm drawing uh, the whiskers, I'm not drawing them as in they're going to be the dark part. I'm drawing like, oh, next to it, I will leave a little gap, if that makes sense. So anyways, uh, as I'm frantically looking through all of the colors at the art store and they're like, <laughs> every worker, I swear, just came up and was like, hey, like 10 minutes, we close, come on. Uh, and so I'm trying to get this all figured out I just picked like one of every color I could think of and whatever one I liked so I have a rainbow however there are definitely ones that I glom onto more 
if that's a word. Glom. We've got crunchy textures and glomming. <laughs> so that is one of those things that um, I think is a happy accident because it taught me more about what colors I really like and what colors I drift away from more. And then sometimes I feel the need to do justice to the colors that I kind of don't use as much. So there's this purple that I don't use as much uh, in this set of pastels. And I feel very much like it deserves better. <laughs> so I have consciously tried to put it in more pieces lately. I also think this might be my uh, drawtober, inktober, whatever. Like I might want to uh, use the pastels as my medium because I've just been loving them so much. And it's really fun to make little pieces with them. And I'm curious, are you guys thinking about that yet? Are you uh, looking for any kind of art challenges to get you excited to create maybe with a different medium? And hey, as we're doing this right now, maybe the different medium isn't necessarily traditional. Maybe it is digital, but you're going to try to emulate something traditional so that it feels like a new medium to you. Wade says, yes, don't treat it too precious. You can always make it again and likely better the more you do it. You know, just like practice. Exactly. I so agree. Doing things in an iterative way can really open up your mind to change and to uh, break through the idea of treating, treating your work too preciously, because that can be a death knell, <laughs> not to be too dramatic, but it does sometimes feel like a trap. It's a trap. All right. So I'm just coloring in these areas exactly as I would with a pastel. I'm trying to be intentional with my marks and really uh, follow the flow of what I'm coloring around. So when I'm doing like this curve into the uh, the corner of the sparkle, <laughs> I want to make it feel like it's following that curve because that feels natural to me. And in the end, I really like having a feel of motion that you can see almost the artist working when you're looking at the piece. You can sense where their marks came from and where they went. And that is one of the really big uh, upsides to pastels because they are basically a history of the mark making of the artist. You can really see their hand in it. It's so funny because Anthony actually, uh, Anthony Sims in the chat, hi, uh, took me to a ceramics demonstration uh, where the instructor workshop person was an amazing teacher and speaker and creator. And what he did was um, he emphasized the autobiographical nature of putting your mark on something that you make with your hands. Cause he was working with ceramics and he's like, when I press my thumb in here, I want it to be really intentional because that's my mark and it's going to be baked into it. And it's, it's autobiographical. It's part of you. It is telling a story of how you were here and how you chose to mark this piece. And I'm thinking about that now a lot with traditional media and how it, uh, it t tells the story of the person making it. And it's not necessarily a story in the traditional sense where it's like, oh, <laughs> a man walked down the street, blah, blah, blah. It was, uh, it's more of a, a sense that a person was here and that you can see their mark being made and why they chose to make it that way. And maybe a little bit of their point of view on life. And I always think there's something to be said about like the point of view of somebody who chooses to make art as a person, <laughs> because I think we're all inherently curious. We are all people who like to make something and put it out in the world. And that says something about us. So just take that for what it's worth. A little bit of existentialism in the morning. <laughs> All right. So you can see like things like the tail really take form when you carve out the negative space. So before it was just lines on an empty page and now suddenly it's a tail. Look at that. Now, in no way is this perfect. And that is exactly the point. <laughs> so embrace the imperfections, baby. All right. So we've got this whole little scape with our cat. But let's see what we did traditionally next. All right, so I have to turn on this whole group. There we go. <laughs> so we see the uh, outlines and then the fill in with the green, which is exactly what we did. What changed here? We have a little bit of colored pencil filling in the eyes and the nose. Let's go back here and check that out. So I'm going to create a new layer. I'm going to go back to my pencil brush 
and worry not nothing is lost in our brushes because again it saves it i'm gonna go to it like a dark red because i just feel like that that fits this piece usually i have a black colored pencil in real life but i am open to playing with it i've actually started playing with um red colored pencil a little bit on top of this and seeing how that comes out so let's go back to here that was super quick right and then yay okay so i added a little bit of red colored pencil like i was just talking about on top of this one now this is experimental not that any of this isn't experimental <laughs> but it's one of those things that like i'm still figuring out for my own process whether i like this or not and i added these little kind of fringe pieces on the end in a way mimicking uh textile so i'm thinking like a rug i think that would be really fun to feel like this is almost like a woven rug because the texture to me is very reminiscent of a nice weave. <laughs> Get a nice weave. And then I added some uh, color, or color, what do you call it? Uh, up close pictures so that you can really see the texture that is created in this piece. You can see a lot of the scratchy but waxy kind of texture that the pastels have. And then on top of that, I used that colored pencil, especially right up on the bridge of the cat's nose. You can see that's the past or the colored pencil on top of the pastel. Like I said, the wax creates a resist. So it's not exactly the true color or texture of the colored pencil. It's a unique combination of colored pencil on top of wax pastel, which I think is really fun. Um, another element to these pastels that I think is so cool is they are water soluble. And that means that you can, if you take a little bit of water on a brush and you zhuzh it on the paper, it becomes watercolor-esque. So it can be completely created. This whole thing could be created with just those pastels, which is really fun and really cool. Uh, Alessandra says, I am excited to try those acrylic gouaches. Have you tried them? I love acrylic gouache. I think it's so, so, so much fun. Uh, my favorite right now is the Liquitex acrylic gouaches. Um, I've heard really good things about other brands though as well. And I think that Acrylic gouache is one of those really fun ones to draw on top of as well. And that's one of the other reasons that I got the, um, these, I'm going for the pencil brush, uh, what are, what am I talking about? One of the reasons that I got these, uh, oh, pastels. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, is that you can draw on top of other mediums with them very opaquely. So if you're painting a uh, acrylic gouache scene and it dries, it almost has kind of a, a chalky texture to it. It's got tooth, which means that colored pencil and pastels are like ideal for it because it just catches on there and goes on super fine, fine and nice. <laughs> and so I would highly recommend trying mixing those medias. All right. So uh, one thing that we can try is just adding a little bit of zhuzh. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, and wherever you feel that colored pencil kind of could live. And I always am in between. What do you guys think? Cat mouth? No cat mouth. I don't know. I'm kind of torn. Look at me, I'm torn. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, a pinky feet. <laughs> I don't know exactly why, but I am called to do this by the piece. As Anthony Jackson said, the piece is talking to me and it says, do this. And one of the great things about the pastel brush in Fresco is that if you are using the pencil perpendicular to the screen, it's a sharp tip. And if you make it a little bit more parallel, you can get this nice little side of the brush action. So you can zhuzh it across. Do you guys see that? It's like this instead of this. And that's just the angle of the brush. That's all. So again, we are given a glorious amount of control in digital media, but it doesn't necessarily mean we have to use it. As in, we can pick and choose when to limit ourselves so that we can really bring out our our best working pr uh, process, I would say, because I think the process is really what's important. Instead of feeling like I have to create this piece because it has to be beautiful, blah, 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 uh, I think what we should be thinking about is what do we enjoy making the most? 
And right now I'm going through a process of figuring that out. I mean, it's a lifelong process, <laughs> I have to say, but it is something that is worth figuring out for sure. And I hope you're on it too, because this is, it's so worth it to find what you love making. And I'm not saying like, just because of the end product, I'm saying because of the process of making it, it's so much fun to make art. So why limit yourself to just making art that's like kind of fun when you can just have a lot of fun? All right, so I'm gonna add these little fringes just so we can have a one-to-one -one comparison with our traditional piece. And I think what we're gonna find is that it's not one or the other. It's not like, oh yes, I definitely love traditional or I definitely love digital. It's both in different ways and for different reasons. And what I would really hope to come out of today's stream for you and for me is that we can use both of them to inform the other. So what we can do is like understand that there are pros and cons, that sometimes digital gives us too much control and sometimes traditional can be frustratingly limited. Sometimes uh, when we want to change color palettes, it would be faster to do it in fresco. But when we want to create a finished piece, we could use the traditional media to create the bulk of it. And then we could bring it into fresco and we could use our, tradi or our, our traditional brushes <laughs> to add that bit of texture to just touch it up. There are so many ways that they can work together. And that is really what I'm going for lately because I want to... Uh, personally, I should say, I am a children's book illustrator, and I want to use a lot of traditional media lately. It has been so much fun to do. But one of the things that I feel is limiting is the ability to do whole like spreads of a book and then change something because clients want changes all the time. And it's so much easier to change them digitally. So I think what it's going to be in the future for me is going forward using both. <laughs> Por que no las dos? <laughs> Anthony is quoting to Annika, uh, but said in the same way as make it work from Tim Gunn. Oh my gosh. Tim Gunn in the chat, please. Wade says, ooh, a Tim Gunn reference. Digging it. Uh, if you guys haven't seen Project Runway, go watch it. <laughs> oh, Alessandra has to go. Have a good day, everyone. See ya, Alessandra. Thank you so much for hanging with us. And thank you, everybody, for being here. It's been a joy to be back. <laughs> okay. So uh, two things that I want to do to really juice up the texture. One of the things I noticed uh, when doing this digitally, when I was just practicing it for, for you guys, was that I, when I use pastel on top of the colored pencil, if we look closely at this guy, some of the colored pencil comes through from the backside, even though there's pastel over it. So what I want to do is create that kind of illusion here. And what I found the best, it was the best way to kind of get that feeling to it is to make it an overlay layer. And then it feels like when it's underneath the pastel, it gets a little bit of informed color from it. It doesn't disappear, but it's still like, it feels like it's integrated a little bit. Now, the next thing is kind of a big one. That texture layer that we used on the back is not just for the back. So I think we should just zhuzh it up here and boom, look at that. Oh my gosh, so much more texture suddenly. There's so much to be said for having an actual paper texture involved in your digital pieces. And I think that I'm going to go forward using much more of that <laughs> kind of technique. Uh, Kendall says, I like bringing traditional art into my digital stuff too. Absolutely. Kendall's work is an amazing example of traditional digital meeting and just being so happy together. Okay. Uh, one thing I think I'm going to try without the mouth just to see what I think. What do you think? No mouth, mouth. I feel like without mouth, it's almost like more of a mysterious cat where it's like, ooh, a spirit cat from out in the wastes. Uh, okay, so one more thing I think I had here. No, I didn't. Okay, one more thing is I have a yellow pastel and I think I want to use that. So I'm going to go back to my hard pastel brush and just color in the little sparklies. And I think with this one, because this pastel is lighter than the others, it has a little bit different of an effect on them. So I might want to go in and try out some of these. I think lighter color kind of gets it. 
not soft light mm, hard light kind of gets it okay so i'm trying to look for that similar feel where like if the green pastel and the yellow pastel overlapped it would feel like one of them is a little bit less opaque than the other does that make sense hope it does and so i'm going to just loosely color these guys in zoop, zoop, zoop. Zoop, zoop, zoop. there we go oh wait that looks uh i'm not racing oh my gosh do as i say not as i do I would be more careful in traditional life. That's what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and myself. Okay, there we go. Zoop, zoop. I just wanted a little bit sharper because it was looking a little messy. Then we have a little bit of a pop. Beep, beep, beep. So this is how I've been doing the cats. Uh, let's see what they look like next to each other just to see the difference and the similarities. Because again... That's kind of the whole thing. All right. So this guy versus this guy. What do you think? Do we get some of that texture in there? Do we get some of the chunky texture, <laughs> as we like to say? Uh, Anthony says it's Halloween now. All the craft stores say so. Oh, yes. I would very much like it to be Halloween now. All right, excellent. So uh, what I'm going to do is, since we have a little bit of time left, we've got like less than 15 minutes what I wanted to do is try one more piece real quick because you guys saw how quick that was that was a lot of um just mark making and talking about what we were doing uh what I'm gonna do is put all these guys in a group and I think what we should do is make a beetle because I've really enjoyed making beetles I left one behind oh no all right you gotta make sure to select every layer Every single one. Got them all? Got them all? Okay. There we go. Group. Boop. Group and boop it. <laughs> all right. So let's uh, un unselect. There we go. Beep. So I wanted to show you how I create uh, the these beetles. So this is one of my beetles. I don't know if you can see it. But it is uh, a really fun exercise to get kind of abstracted in the idea of shape and texture and color. So I'm just going to really quickly kind of design out a beetle. I want it to be, okay, so what I'm thinking here is a smaller top and a larger bottom. And I'm just using some shortcut shapes that I have kind of thought of for beetles. These are not necessarily anatomically correct, <laughs> but I like them. So I'm going to give it one of these guys on the front. And ooh, should we give it googly eyes? Because that's always fun. <laughs> and I think the legs kind of ish go like this. And then they have little feet that kind of like go like that. Again, shorthand, not anatomically correct. And the fun part for this, this is just the sketch of like the overall shape. But the fun part with this is going in with pastels or, you know, our digital brushes and picking out some of these colors to just go kind of hog wild with. And what we can do is create uh, patterns. So what I think I want to do up here is create kind of like a starburst. Oh, and I forgot to lay down a, <laughs> a base layer. So, hey, the beauty of digital, we can do a base layer. Whoops. Uh, let's do with the blocky mixer again. What color should it be? Maybe blue? No, let's do mm, from behind. Let's do orange. So this could be any color because in theory, I'd be using a, uh, whoa, that color change. <laughs> That's fun. I like that. Okay. And then we're going to use a little bit of watercolor to zhuzh. Zhuzh, zhuzh. Let's just turn that up a little bit. And then zhuzh, 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 zhuzh. again, noises are essential. <laughs> uh, so the background being just wild color and mostly covered up is really fun. So be loose and fast and free with that background. And then I'm going to use probably that same dark green to do some hard outlining on this. Beep, beep. Okay, so I've got the hard pastel. Yes. I'm going to make it a slightly smaller brush. 
Zoop. And go in and just get those legs. Zoop. And this is the uh, easy part. The harder part is going around all of this. So if you want to color in the background with something that isn't orange, which is my plan, then going around these legs is a little difficult, but that's exactly the fun part of the challenge. <laughs> now, you don't have to make it a challenge like that if you're doing it digitally again, but I choose to challenge myself, okay? All right, let's use straight up red and come in here with some cool shapes. Let's do kind of like a Mandalorian helmet thing. Do 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 do. Yeah, yeah. And then let's do circles. I'm just choosing random shapes. Oh my gosh, it's a face, you guys. Oh, I love it. Let's give him a mustache. It's called an angry old man beetle. <laughs> I love him. Ah, oh, it's so good. <laughs> Annika says that's exactly how the brush sounds. How did you know? <laughs> oh, I love it. Beetle Bailey. Uh, amazing. <laughs> Anthony says, yeah, make the beetle look super silly. Uh, done and done. All right. So I'm thinking of like the brushes or the pastel colors that I have. And we've got that blue. Let's make it a little bit like that. And if we go in with a complementary color to the background, the background as it seeps through is going to really pop. So always think of that, like the little color theory stuff in your head. It's very useful. Keep it in mind. And then the like working around the legs, you see those little gaps of orange. That's exactly why we do it this way. It's not just to make it a challenge for ourselves. It's not to perfectly color in the lines. You're intentionally creating something that you can't color in the lines of. And that's the goal. Make it a little weird. Can you tell I'm from Portland? Make it weird. <laughs> Tim Gunn is back again. Oh, I love it. Okay. We only have a few minutes left and I want to encourage you guys to stick around for the uh, pro tips after this. And I also caught uh, a familiar friend yesterday on this same hour of entertainment. It was Ryan Selvi who did video editing tips and tricks all over the place. And I highly suggest you check it out because that was a fantastic stream. Ryan always does a great job. But you should also check out just everything that is available on the Adobe Live channel, honestly, because we got some good people talking about some good stuff. <laughs> Kendall says, put a bird on it. Oh my gosh. And Wade agrees. Oh, you know what I forgot? Hey, yet another beautiful thing about digital is I can go in here and erase out some sparkles because of course we have to have sparkles. Are you kidding me? What are we drawing a beetle for if we don't have sparkles? What do you guys think? Beetles? Are they cool? Because I think they're pretty cool. I got kind of attacked by one. Uh, not the other day, but when I first moved in here, there was a massive beetle that was attracted to the light on the back porch. And it was massive. It was massive. I need to look up what kind it was because I got a picture and it's like, it was big, man. Okay, so I'm going to race out a bigger shape and then kind of cut in with the, the pastel brush again. Now, the downside to this is we're not getting those marks that follow the shape of the sparkle. You remember before I was doing like these kind of marks. And I do think that that is a strength. So I would be more intentional if I were to do this again to try to plan out the sparkles beforehand. Like over here. Hey, look at that. Ah, ha, ha, ha. But anyways, it's all up to you what you do. And honestly, some of these differences that I pick out other people might totally not see, but it's really, again, what you find the most enjoyable to make, not necessarily the look that you enjoy the most, but what do you like making? Because that's what's going to really carry you through your entire career, hobby, whatever this is for you. It stays fun because you make it fun. <laughs> so definitely pay attention to what you enjoy most about the process. Oh, Anthony's quoting me. I think beetles are cool. They attack me. <laughs> Quote. <laughs> uh, Kendall says, I like beetles, but they've been trying to eradicate some recently since we have invasive species. Oh my gosh, invasive species. Get out of here. 
But yeah, overall, I understand that beetles are cool. And especially this angry man beetle that we created. Uh, I don't like you very much. That's what he says. Choop, 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 choop. Choop, 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 choop. Choop, 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 choop. All right, I'm going to go back to the green layer, I think. No, I'm going to go back to the red layer. And I'm going to make the head red. Choop, 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 choop. And I'm going to go back to the yellow layer, because we don't have enough yellow, clearly. I'm going to give him little yellow blushies. Cute! Oh, I love him. Little zoop zoop, zoop zoop. The more detailed, the better, really, with these guys. Because beetles be detailed. All right. We are pretty much there. I just want to say it has been so much fun pastelling with you guys. So definitely try it out if you haven't before. I think you would really enjoy it. It's such a fun medium, traditionally and digitally. Uh, again, if you want to see all of the settings that I changed for... Oh, gosh. All right. I'm going to have to group these again. Uh, 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 if you want to see all of the settings that I changed for the hard pastel brush, I'm going to show those to you again. Boop. These guys. All right. So that is the end of the stream for today. Oh, I grouped it all. <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging around, you guys. And I will see you again very soon. Definitely. <laughs> what am I doing? Definitely stick around for the pro tips after this. I will uh, see you again soon and have a great day. Thank you so much for being here. Bye.